Right, so I just want to set the expectation levels correctly for this talk. The answer is no. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, I'll explain later. But, you know, nearly. Okay, so stopping outbreaks, becoming epidemics. Um, this, we're going to talk a lot about nanopore sequencing, but, but this is the focus of the talk. Um, and uh, it occurs to me now, and actually Dan Turner, you can tell all the speakers that have young children because you had Dan Turner with Maisie yesterday. You know, whenever you think for inspiration, all you can really think of is this, things like Dr. Zeus books you read to your children. Um, and so, um, you know, amazing the places that Minion has been taken in the last year. You know, I think um, we predicted that, that the portability of the Minion would be important and it would mean that people would start sequencing in extreme uh, environments. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've made a rhyme. I'm not going to uh, labor it, but we have done some boat sequencing. This was with Andrew Rambo and uh, Josh Quick um, and uh, uh, Lonely Joe Parker. I don't know if he's here. Uh, sequenced at least uh, with a goat or near a goat, probably, uh, when he did his plant sequencing. Um, we have sequenced on a plane. Th uh, thank God this wasn't United Airlines. I. I <laughs> i absolutely terrified to think what happened, but uh, this is Josh um, um, on a plane uh, sequencing. I don't know if that's allowed. Don't necessarily do that. Um, Arwen Edwards recently pre-printed uh, down a big hole, or specifically down a mine in Wales. Uh, another Arwen Edwards at one of the poles, and I think uh, both the Arctic and Antarctic have been conquered with nanopore sequencing, and of course, outer space, Kate Rubens, and I think there's some more space sequencing going on Really interested to see um, how that looks. And of course, in Africa, uh, at quite a pace in real time during Ebola. So before I move on to Ebola, which we're going to talk about a bit, um, there are quite a few places, notable places, where minion sequencing hasn't been done. You've probably got some ideas yourselves. There's one very notable place that I'm going to come back to at the end of the talk. Maybe you can guess uh, where it is. So, I last spoke at London Calling, the first London Calling in 2015, and that was a really important time for us and really got uh, this idea of real-time prospective in-field sequencing uh, established. And Josh spoke, um, and Lauren Cowley, I think, spoke, and Miles Carroll spoke. Uh, no, Lauren Cowley spoke the, the year after. Miles Carroll spoke that year in 2015. And we were very excited because we had managed to do successful Ebola sequencing uh, in Guinea um, and establish that rapidly and establish uh, that ability to go from a clinical sample to a whole genome and a phylogenetic analysis in a, in a time scale of days rather than months or even years as had been traditional in kind of real, in kind of retrospective analysis of outbreaks. And we thought that that was very, very important. And uh, just to illustrate that, it was early, early on when we presented this back in May 2015. Since then, uh, we sequenced around 160, 170 Ebola genomes, one genome per flow cell. Can you imagine that? 20 kb genome, one flow cell burning each of time, quite a lot of flow cells. Um, but that was important because it was important to run the sequencing as soon as the sample was available because our idea was this information would only be useful if you could generate it quickly enough to feed back to the WHO, to the national coordination, to the epidemiologists, and use that information. And critically, you need, you need the fast time to answer, but you also need very, very good coverage of the outbreak. And so um, from May time, around 50% of the cases were sequenced, um, all of the cases um, in Guinea. And that's very, very important in terms of getting a good sampling frame so you can actually understand the chains of transmission and the connection between cases. Actually, a load of interesting, uh, both epidemiological studies, uh, real uh, important findings for outbreak response, and biological findings came out of that work, and, and various publications following on from that initial publication um, and detailed some of those uh, interesting findings. One very important thing that we established early on, and this is a model for all the outbreak and epidemic work we do, is that the data needs to be shared openly as quickly as is practically possible um, and is ethically possible. 
And uh, that means anonymized data onto places like um, ne the next strain site from, Richard Bed uh, from Trevor Bedford and Richard Nayer. And because others were doing sequencing, for example, Ian Goodfellow in, in Sierra Leone, we were able to identify connections between cases that wouldn't have been possible if we'd only analyzed our own data sets. So critically, in this case, cross-border transmissions between uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone, important information for the national coordination who really considered Ebola to be a national problem. We could identify very clearly links down to individual SNP level uh, um, um, between cases and between chains of transmission such that when a new case popped up in a new uh, uh, county or prefecture in West Africa, we could say whether it was linked to known cases. And that was really important for epidemiologists who couldn't um, often identify the chain of transmission, often due to it, you know, it's suspicion and distrust of the, the national coordination and the, and the uh, global response to, to the epidemic. And so that information provided uh, was very useful for providing extra information for epidemiologists. We one of the notable things about Ebola, we kind of thought it was over by around September, October uh, 2015, but it wasn't. Um, there were numerous flare-ups, and there was a very, uh, it was a reasonably large flare-up as late as March 2016, so just last year. Um, and in that case, there was about a six-month delay since that case and any other cases. Uh, and people started thinking, well, how's that happened? Is this a new introduction from an animal reservoir? What's going on? And in fact, in this case, we could use the, the Minion sequencing to identify that this was both connected to a previous case, a case over 500 days previously of a survivor, um, and uh, link it to these new cases, and in fact to the survivor's seminal fluid, which was persistently uh, 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 infected uh, uh, with Ebola, resulting in transmission, resulting in flare-up, and, and remarkably resulting in a cross-border transmission into Liberia. And the novel biology we can find is this idea of a frozen-in-time phenomenon. These Ebola viruses have slow-evolving uh, genotypes, uh, and that's important for understanding whether this is a hidden chain or a, uh, or a result of, of transmission for survivor. So this video is 1,600 Ebola genomes from uh, reconstructed uh, with geographical information. I'm not going to talk over it. I'm just going to show how Ebola spread from the starting point in Gwekidu in Guinea uh, across the period of, of two years. Coming to the end now. So that video is from Andrew Rambo, Gittis Dudas, uh, uh, Philip LeMay, and others, and recently, recently published in Nature. That's 1,600 genomes with their associated geographical uh, tag. That's about 5% of the outbreak. So that map and that animation represents uh, over 30,000 cases of, of Ebola um, and, and over 10,000 deaths. You know, absolutely horrific human tragedy. But what should be apparent from, from this video and, and, and from this uh, phylogeny is that how many opportunities were missed here to control these chains of transmission? You can regard this as multiple separate outbreaks, if you like, all starting from the same uh, original index case, but uh, diversifying into different geographical spread. And how many opportunities to stop Ebola moving uh, very large distances between countries and within countries? And, and that's the critical uh, um, question. Can we now start to think about using sequencing to try and change that epidemic curve? We didn't get deployed until April 2015, very, very late in the outbreak. The, the Ebola uh, 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 cases themselves had a significant diagnostic delay from the very first case uh, in December 2013. 
you know, is there a role for getting in and, and helping provide sequencing information or, uh, either for diagnostics uh, or for outbreak, understanding the dynamics, the phylogenomics of the outbreak and the, the transmission of the outbreak? And, and is there an opportunity to make better interventions earlier on? And this would be very important with Ebola now because we have a vaccine for Ebola, but we, we can't vaccinate the entire population. And so if we were going to plan vi ring vaccination trials, as have been successfully trialed during the last epidemic, you'd really want to understand the connections between all of the cases. So this takes us on to Zika. And, um, <laughs> so Nuno Farrier last year at London Calling introduced the Zebra Project. We were just about to go to Brazil and help, look, uh, uh, help understand the Zika uh, epidemic in the Americas by taking a bus around Brazil. And I looked back at the grant proposal we wrote to the MRC and we said that we would sequence 750 genomes on the minion from humans and mosquitoes. Unbelievable level of arrogance. I can't, you know, even for me. Um, that w was insane in retrospect, um, and I'll tell you why. Not because, not because you can't sequence 750 genomes on a minion, you, very, you actually can. Um, the trip went well, we got, we got there, no one died. The bus did catch on fire um, when the air conditioning unit kind of uh, uh, caught fire, and that was kind of a bit, a bit awkward for a minute. But um, we, we got round and we, we helped with, in collaboration with the Brazil Public Health uh, Laboratories, helped collect uh, um, do diagnostics, surveillance, uh, and sequencing. And I'm not going to talk about the epidemiology. See Oli Pibus, who uh, has got a talk in uh, the pathogen breakout session later. He's going to talk about some of the data. But I just want to say that Zika turned out to be, you know, almost impossible to sequence with kind of conventional um, approaches. So um, th these, these are, this is data from Christian Anderson and Nathan uh, Grubel from a paper that's um, in press, but there's a preprint available where they show what happens if you try and do metagenomic sequencing on a, Zika, Zika, on a typical Zika clinical sample. And the CT value is here between something like 34 and 36, which, which translates to a genome equivalence, a number of genome copies of around 10 to 40. You know, if you do, this is my sequencing, if you do metagenomics, um, you know, you get, in some of these cases, you get no Zika reads. And even in the case where you do get Zika reads, you get reasonably poor coverage of the genome. In most cases, not enough to do a phylogenetic uh, reconstruction. So metagenomics is really not an effective technique uh, out of the box. And really, this is one of our big challenges if we want to do uh, pathogen diagnostics with sequencing, which is that there are significant challenges with pathogen enrichment. Uh, and there are two kind of problems. One is that a typical sample contains a lot of background uninteresting information like boring human DNA or um, uh, other, other bacteria in the case of something like a stool sample. But also the minion requires, at the moment, quite a large number of molecules to, to sequence effectively. And as Clive mentioned, that, that, that may come down. But at the moment, really, 100 nanogram, nanograms is required. And so you've got various approaches for trying to enrich a clinical sample, trying to, trying to sequence a, a virus. Um, and, uh, you know, loosely you've got PCR, you've got WGA, you've got bait probes, and you've got a kind of hybrid where you do bait probe capture and amplification. But as we get into WGA and baits and WGA baits, the, the time and the complexity and the labor uh, goes up. So PCR really represents uh, a, a very pragmatic, easy way of both amplifying virus or bacteria uh, uh, and enriching at the same time such that you can put it straight into the minnow. We don't really like PCR, but that, that's what works. So this led uh, Josh to spend a couple of months after the zebra trip. We got some genomes, but they were low coverage and we weren't really happy with them. And we knew we'd have to go back and, and do some more sequencing. So Josh spent a couple of months in the lab trying to resolve this problem. And he came up with this, I hope Gordon, uh, very into his music, approves of our primal scheme idea, which is uh, um, um, this, this artwork's from Oli Pibus. So Primal Scheme is a way of now going in and rapidly designing a multiplex PCR uh, panel 
for tiling uh, um, uh, Amplicon sequences to sequence uh, viruses. And we have schemes for that work and have been validated against known reference sequences for Zika and chikungunya and yellow fever. And that's something you can go in. It seems to be very, very popular looking at the, the, the number of people that have submitted uh, their own uh, reference genomes to, to create these schemes. And so with this system, we can sequence Zika and we can get reasonably complete genomes uh, up to around CT of 36. We think when we're getting to CT of 37, a lot of the samples are over CT 36, but half of them are. We think we're getting down to only a few viral genome copies uh, uh, per microliter, or maybe in the entire sample. It becomes very, very difficult. And we can get these, you get this kind of quite fragmented looking appearance, uh, but you can get enough information from these fragmented uh, genomes. You can see that amplicons, more, some amplicons drop out more often uh, than others from the scheme, but you can get good Im information from those genomes to let you do phylogenetics. So Olipibus, I'm not going to give away the Zika story because Olipibus is going to talk about it, but now we've got everything in place to start doing this kind of viral outbreak surveillance in real time much more quickly. So in the last few weeks, we've been looking at yellow fever, Although this is a vaccine-preventable disease, there's currently a, a pretty large outbreak uh, of yellow fever in Brazil. It's caused over 250 deaths. Normally, yellow fever cycles between hemagogous mosquitoes and non-human primates, uh, and humans are an incidental host. Uh, that's, that's the case in this outbreak, we think. But uh, there is a, a real fear that if this can get into AEDs, which it can do, can be transmitted by AEDs, you can get into a, uh, uh, um, um, a cycle between AEDs and humans, uh, and that could be very serious, uh, if particularly if it got into a, a heavily populated area. So this was, this, this was much quicker. You just put the, put, Josh put the reference genomes that we have available into Primal Scheme generate primers, you know, uh, a week to wait for the university to process the primer, primer order, and then once we've got that, that's a joke, they're really good, um, and um, we were to get primers, primer sequence, test it out down at DST, uh, down at PHE Port and Down, apologies, and uh, we were able to take this to Brazil. And crucially, and like very importantly for Josh's relationship and my relationship, um, we didn't have to go this time, okay? Getting started feeling very guilty about sending Josh into, hot, into, into difficult scenarios. We, we can now enable our colleagues to do this work themselves. It doesn't need us. We've got a protocol. We've got uh, um, the software. And um, this, was, this was done uh, uh, in collaboration um, with uh, Luis Alcantara's group and Theo Cruz, um, and also Oli Pibus and, uh, and Nuno Faria. Uh, and so Nuno and Sarah from Oxford uh, went, went to help get the set up, bring the reagents out. But we managed in this case to do six genomes for flow cell. Um, we could do probably 12 genomes for flow cell, just limited by number of barcodes. Generate very reliably one to four million reads per flow cell on these 500 base pair amplicons. Um, and uh, helped by the fact that, that yellow fever has a lower CT. Um, and then this is the resulting information. So I think Ollie's going to talk about what all this means in his talk. So I need to speed up because I'm going to run out of time. But now we have a really, really nice system for generating these schemes, a protocol for running it on the MinIron, and we have a software pipeline that, that allows you know, difficult to install software, you know, particularly people like Mick Watson, um, <laughs> like Portals and Nanoposh to run on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Uh, very simple to get in, versioned. Uh, integrated with test suites, quality control reports. And we think this is the model for this kind of work where you just routinely want to get in and do viral sequencing. Right, so now I have to kind of do an awkward segue into long reads. Um, and so my way of getting into long reads is to talk about antibiotic resistance. And um, this, uh, to slightly embarrassing, but also kind of quite nice. Uh, this this poster is plastered all over the tube at the moment. If you ever go to Houston, you'll see me just going up and down <laughs> uh, the escalator. I'd spend about an hour a day doing that, so come and see me. <laughs> no one's recognized me yet. Uh, I, I, that's what I look like in, in person. I look, we all kind of look a bit like we've just escaped from a burning building here, uh, because we are heroes. Um, but. I haven't actually done any antibiotic resistance work for a little while, to my, uh, to my great shame. But, but now we're in a situation with these higher yield min-iron flow cells. Five gigs is very, very achievable. We get that a lot. 
um, where you can easily do things like mix a couple of isolates together, um, do a 1D rapid kit, 1D ligation kit, and pull out either single contig or one or two contig uh, assemblies and the plasmids uh, as, as whole uh, um, 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 contigs. And that's just, that's really important for clinical microbiology because, and for antibiotic resistance, because you can think of antibiotic resistance as an epidemic or an outbreak. You can almost think of it as an, an outbreak of plasmids, an outbreak of, or an epidemic of plasmids. And we need to control these, these multidrug resistant uh, antibiotic uh, uh, um, um, uh, aid, uh, resistance um, uh, genes in the environment because that's what's getting into our hospitals and giving us problems with hard to treat uh, uh, infections and potentially impossible to treat infections uh, in the future. So that's, the, uh, that's the, the way I segue into long reads. And this isn't the answer to my original question, but you know, someone should sequence inside a whale. That just seems like an obvious thing to do. Why has no one done that? You're not trying hard enough. But whales is also our name for these long reads, and I think Josh already talked about this in some detail, but effectively uh, we have a mapping between the mass of a whale um, and the read length, so just replace kilograms for, for kilobases, and we're now in the kind of narwhal spotting territory, but you know, I want a blue whale, 140 meg, like a whole big chromosome from the human genome in one go. It must be coming, it must be possible. We've made, so this, that's why the answer to the original question was no, we haven't yet got a megabase read, despite absolute superhuman effort from Josh over the last couple of days. But we're getting bloody close, okay? Uh, and we've had a flow sort of running outside, and I've been periodically checking it throughout the conference. <laughs> what, <laughs> so I'm not going to go into details about this method, because Josh already talked about it. The protocol's online. There's stuff on my blog about it. There's also stuff in the human genome preprint. Uh, about how we did this, but I will just say a recent improvement in the last uh, few days is to move from just taking a lot of very high molecular weight phenylchloroform purified DNA and putting it into the rapid kit in great abundance to a system where we're extracting the E. coli cells in an agarose plug uh, and then uh, using that to try and maintain the whole chromosomes and then into the RAD kit. And you can see there's a great improvement on our previous e, e. coli results, the N50, read N50, up to 128 KB. To put this into perspective, we can get across the whole E. coli genome now in seven reads. Seven reads. Not, it's all right, isn't it? It's okay. It's not really, I'm not very happy of it, but seven reads is quite good. I, I, Antonio, when he talked about the E. coli yesterday, he said that it will get really upset about the original E. coli project. It cost like $7 million and took however many years. Like, you can do it in seven reads and probably, well, it takes, it takes quite a long time actually for these long reads to go through. It can take over an hour for one of these reads to go through the port. So, it's kind of slow actually. Someone should work on that. Anyway. The longest read that we've got on here, this prep is 886. Frustratingly close, we had one that was longer, 911. But this wasn't a real read, and it was actually one of these naturally occurring 1D squared reads where you, where you get the template and the complement. You haven't, haven't used the 1D squared kit. It's just that idea that you, the, 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 the complement follows through. And so this, to me, is really exciting. Uh, the preprint that we put up uh, Sergey, Sergey Corin and Philippi postulated, could we, with this data set, if we get enough of these ultra-long reads, can we finish, we trivially finish or nearly finish a human genome up to human genome reference standards or perhaps even beyond? And he speculates that if we had 30x of this data set, we would be somewhere around a contig N50 of 40, 50, even 60 meg. Um, and really where we want to be, if the accuracy comes up a little bit more, we can get up to effectively nearly finished uh, human genome. So I think that's remarkable. So I've nearly run out of time, or I have run out of time. So I, I went and looked at my old talk in 2015 and tried to work out uh, what I said back then. And I said the min iron is unique because it's real time, portable, super long reads. I was, I was bang on at the time, I think. And I asked for fast mode, more pause. We got fast mode in the, in the end. Diagnostic environmental metagenomics is now possible. Those ultra reads will do an incredible job on metagenomes. I'm absolutely sure of it. People need to start trying that uh, uh, now. Rapid sample prep we've got. Direct RNA sequencing we've got. We haven't quite got very low input yet, and that's a, a limitation. So my current wish list is 
We get the local base calling much faster, still incredibly slow. Um, um, takes 240 core server to keep up with those yellow fever runs. That's not really good enough. No more file format changes, please, guys. It's all right. Um, we really want those lower cost, lower throughput flow cells, um, such as the smidge iron flongle uh, concept. And we need the ultra low sensitive, we need the high sensitivity ultra low input. Excited about maybe dumping PCR for this CAS9 idea. But the answer to my question is, where haven't we done any sequencing yet? It's unbelievable, because we've done the Ebola work in Africa, and we've done the Zika work in Brazil, yellow fever. We're not doing it in the NHS. Why the hell are we not doing it in the NHS yet? That's ridiculous. You know, we know it works for outbreak tracking. We know that there's a role for diagnostic metagenomics. Cancer, it's not been done in the NHS yet. So in the next year, please, let's go and sort that out and bring it uh, to the UK and your local healthcare service. Loads of acknowledgements, particular thanks to Josh Crick. Thanks for your time. I think, thank you, Nick. I think we have time just for one or two questions. Anyone have any questions? Why is it not happening in the NHS? What's slowing it down? Well, the, the mega base. No, what's, why, why aren't we sequencing in the NHS? What why aren't we sequencing in the NHS? NHS? Yeah, well, why is it so hard to sequence in the NHS? It's hard to do anything in the NHS. I've got experience working in the NHS. Um, money, that's got to be an issue. I mean, we, we can get research funding for usually retrospective projects. Um, maybe we can get research money for, for benchmarking prospective projects. But there's, as far as I know, there's not really a budget for uh, doing this kind of work yet. Clinical microbiologists, in my view, have been quite reluctant to adopt these sequencing technologies. I don't know if that's, I don't know why, actually. Um, I think maybe either they don't, have, we haven't proven it well enough to them yet, or maybe they think it's too hard, or I, I don't know. But, but um, we obviously need to do a better job in convincing people. Physicians seem quite into it, would like to do it. We definitely, uh, we definitely think that infectious disease physicians might be a beneficiary of diagnostic metagenomics for hard to diagnose uh, kind of cryptic infections. But I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I think it's just lack of will. You know, we've just got to go and do it. You've just got to prove that it works. So it's, it's, it's not only important that you detect the Zika or the uh, Ebola, uh, Ebola virus, and all, but, but, but it's also more important to see why some individuals are resistant to them. And, Say again, sorry? Some individuals are resistant to the oh, yeah. Ebola, and, and, and then you can hit two, two birds with one stone. So my question is, in your exploration, did you actually discover why some people are resistant to Ebola? Um, no, I mean, I, I mean that's, a, that's, a, that's clearly a human, a human genome right. question. I understand. And I think, I think you know, but, but it does give us you know, one thing we'd like to do is, one thing that's realistic to do is to go and do, try and do pathogen detection discovery and do transcriptome at the same time, you know, looking at RNA viruses. Um, that would give us some information about what's going on in terms of the patient's immune response um, um, to infection. Should we also be doing, do, doing human, human genetic surveys at the same time? Uh, um, yeah, we probably should, probably we can't do that as part of our work, but that's something that, that, that definitely could and should be done. I'm saying thanks, 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 thanks. <laughs> <laughs>